In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I call to you, my Lord. Please listen to my prayer. I come to you with thankfulness. Remember days gone by and all that.
Good morning, everybody. There we go. Is press the right button at the back. Thanks, Ian. Good morning and welcome to worship at Holy Trinity Wester Hales. It's so good that we can come together in, in God's presence. He's here. He's everywhere with us all the time. But to gather as his people in this area, as his people online in their homes, watching it at some other time, who knows, because God is always there. And we're going to start with worship. But I've become aware in my spirit recently that it's nice and easy when the band strike up to sort of go along with it because they're doing it and they're leading it and they are wonderful. All our worship leading teams are amazing at doing that. They bring us into God's nearer presence. But it can be easy to just tag along on the back of it instead of us being there and then we can start to worship more and more. So we have a book of hymns in scripture in the Psalms and the other books, similar books. So I'd invite you now, if you're able, to stand and we'll join our voices as we read one of God's hymns of praise that just reminds us about how eternal God's word is and where he is about his faithfulness. It's not the whole of Psalm 119, you'll be very pleased to hear because we'd all be needing a seat. But let's read together some words from Psalm 119. Not those words, they're for much, much later, Carol. So, your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth and it endures. Your laws endure to this day, for all things serve you. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts. For by them you have preserved my life. Save me, for I am yours. I have sought out your precepts. The wicked are waiting to destroy me, but I will ponder your statutes. To all perfection I see a limit, but your commands are boundless. Amen. And now let's raise our voices as we're led in worship into God's closer presence.
And Lord, we, we just continue to worship in the silence of our hearts, in the peace that you bring to our minds and our spirits. Lord, we come and we bow before you, the only one to whom all creation will eventually bow. But we bow ourselves now. We bow in praise, we bow in adoration. We bow begging mercy and forgiveness. We come before you, the creator and sustainer of all that exists. That mighty God, above and beyond all that we can ever imagine. And at the same time, Lord, we come down to you who dwells in our hearts when we open our lives to you. Christ, who left heaven for us. Christ, who went to the cross for us. Christ, who rose again for each and every one who turns to him. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for that peace that you bring. We thank you that the Holy Spirit moves amongst us, calming, soothing, healing, inspiring, motivating, protecting, and produces fruit in our lives that are then a blessing to others. It's beyond our understanding, Lord, but we don't have to understand. So grant us this morning faith to see you at work in the places we think you're not. Give us hope when everything seems lost and and hopeless. Give us mercy to those that we find difficult to show mercy to. Give us understanding of those that aren't like us. But most of all, Lord, give us a sense of your nearer presence. Dealing with each of us in the way that you need to deal with us today. So in a moment of silence, Lord, we come and we offer you our confession of where we've got it wrong again this week and ask your forgiveness. Lord, may we be ready to accept your forgiveness, to accept the new life that you give to us and be ready to follow in your footsteps wherever you send us and all for the glory of your kingdom, both now and forevermore. Amen. So it's so good that we can come to worship, um, and it's also good that we can be a church family. Uh, I'd like to thank Claudia and Joe for Friday evening. It was a lovely evening um, where a large number of ladies from the congregation... I mean, we had starters for conversations, but really... The conversation never stopped. And I pray that some of the conversations and new friendships will continue to develop. This Friday, it's the gentleman's turn. So anybody got a good Italian accent who can do the announcement? But if not, there might be a picture come up. I'm not too sure if, it's, if Carol managed to find it. The men are having an Italian extravaganza, as far as I know, on Friday at what time? 7.30. There's a, a slight cost because you're going to have a big fancy meal and great entertainment from people dressing up and speaking in what could be considered very rude ways. <laughs> but anyway, um, there's the information. If you've not let people know that you're coming and you want to come, could you tell Andy or Rory, who I don't think is here, or Ian Richardson, and if you can give them some of the money, it's £10 a head. I don't know if you need all the money up front, but anyway, speak to Andy or Ian about that. And gents, if you have a fraction of as good a time as we had on Friday, you're going to have a wonderful evening. So pray that you all enjoy it. Um, It's great that we can do things as a family here, but we are also part of a much, much bigger world. And we've been overwhelmed in Food Bank by donations from other churches and organisations, Harvest Celebrations celebrating God's bounty to the world. And it seems a bit ironic that in somewhere like Wester Hales, where the best thing you see growing is a dandelion, is that people still bring us pumpkins and wonderful things like that. But great. Please do. Also, I didn't know quite how you grew things in tins, but that's equally great. But we want to raise our eyes up from Wester Hales and out into God's world. So as usual, we're going to have our opportunity for us to make a harvest offering. 
and there should be a slide come up for this as well. Typically, we'd look to do something in the wider world and something nearer to home. So the two groups that we're hoping to support, if we give as God leads us, um, we're going to be supporting Tier Fund and some schools work. The Tier Fund work in various parts of the world, and they have projects this year, I think, focusing on Africa. <coughs> I'm not going to do any more information than that, because on the 3rd of November, we're having a Tier Fund service, at which Ricky and Karen will introduce some of the projects that they're doing and ask for prayer support, and that's where we can offer our financial support as well. Closer to home, we've supported the primary schools in the area over the years, so this year we, we felt that, at Ministry Team, we'd like to support the high school. <coughs> at the moment, the head teacher hasn't identified a specific project. He's working on that with his team. But we also support them in letting youngsters from the area go to an SU camp who would have no opportunity to do it a camp specifically tailored to children from this area that Naomi and Haley have got to know over the years. So we'd like to be able to make a donation to make that possible for next year. There's a big increase in the numbers. So just start, pray to God, how does he feel? Is, how is he leading you to share our Harvest Thanksgiving in these ways? The information about giving's up there. The box for donations, so to speak, will be open until the end of November, as far as I know, and we're just that we'll be able to bless these organisations in what they're doing. But they're much nearer to hand. Um, Naomi, are you here? Yes, you are. Naomi's got a, a couple of things to tell us about as well. Good morning. Um, so we're into October and some of you might know that what that means we're having a light party at the end of this month but before we get into talking about when that is and what's happening I thought we could have a wee think about light since the children are all in today before we go down for holiday club if you're visiting and you've not been before it's a holiday week so if you're a primary age child when you see a mass exodus follow us out of there and we're going down to the cafe to do some activities together the younger groups are still on as normal and youth are either helping out in different ways or staying in for the sermon today. Okay, so I've been having a think. I don't know if you've seen on the news, but there are lots of different storms going on around the world. There's been some horrific storms in the physical that people are experiencing, but also just storms of life, really difficult times for a lot of different people. But there's some storm recently that people are quite excited to see. Does anybody know the name of that type of storm that everybody's been getting really excited? And if you're on social media, it's all you'll have seen for a wee while. Alba. The northern lights, yeah, the solar storm, the geomagnetic storms, the things that we see in the sky. Has anybody seen them? And you had, do you dare admit if you hadn't? Everyone's like, yeah, yeah, I saw it, really cool. <laughs> Has anybody seen them? Yeah. And they're amazing, aren't they? And I've got a PowerPoint up here. Chris Hoskins took some absolutely amazing pictures and he's very kindly letting us use them um, on this PowerPoint. So if Carol could maybe flick through some of his images, we get to see just some of the beauty of what was in the skies over the last few nights even. And then we're coming up, there should be a wee video from another friend who was up in Lewis and set a time lapse. Um, if you click that, Carol, I think that should play. A time lapse overnight. And we look at that and look at the beauty of that sky. It's amazing. Eh? I should have put some music to it or something. Eh? So you can see, I don't know if you've been out and experienced it for yourself, maybe some of us were tucked up in bed and you've had to endure everybody else going on about it the next day, but they're really beautiful. And I wanted, um, Hudson's going to do our reading, I think, is he? Do you want to come up, Hudson, and read to us from Colossians? The sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Colossians 1 verse 15 and 16. Thank you, Hudson. It's great reading. Before we get to that, I forgot to show you my photo, Carol. I don't know if it was up there at the end of that PowerPoint. I think there. Um, right at towards the end of the PowerPoint. 
So I was in my son's room the other night and I looked out and I gasped. <gasps> Amazing, I thought I'd captured it from inside the house. And then I realized this was the reflection of their galaxy projector in the window. And I was not experiencing what everyone else was experiencing, but I was just seeing a wee galaxy projector. I did go out and see the real thing afterwards. But actually, we're not talking about fake northern lights or even real northern lights. What we're thinking about is Jesus shows us what invisible God is like, and he is above all creation. And through him and in him, all of that was made. And that includes the wonderful images, the wonderful things we've seen over these last few weeks of the northern lights. And we stand and we look at those beautiful lights in the sky. And if you've seen them, you're literally in awe. You're just stood mesmerized by them. And Jesus is above them in power and in majesty and in beauty. And can you imagine then, if in him those things were created, how great is his light? And we're not saying he's just shining really bright all of a sudden, though there are images of that in the Bible, but actually he is the light. He is everything good and true and pure and holy. And the amazing truth that follows that is that because he is the light, we get to walk in his light. In Colossians there, Hudson read to us um, about who Jesus is. And the verses that follow that say that in Jesus, God reconciled all of creation, all things to him. And that includes us. And that means that when we were lost in darkness and sin and all the things we'd done wrong and we were stuck in that, we couldn't bring ourselves into Jesus's light. But Jesus, the light of the world, died on the cross for us so that we can follow and walk in that light and live in that light forever. So at this time of year when maybe we're seeing dark things around us on the news, maybe we're feeling the darkness of the nights getting closer, maybe you've got dark things going on in your own life. Actually, we're wanting to take some time, just a wee night even, to celebrate the light of Jesus. And so we're having a light party and it's on the 31st of October this year. So it's on Halloween on the Thursday evening. Um, Oh, thanks, Carol. Very prompt. (laughs) Um, There's a Uh, 6 till 7.30. It's P1 to P7. If you're older than that and you're keen to help, we're up for helpers as well. And we've got lots of fun things and we'll come and we'll eat delicious things and we'll do fun things together and we will celebrate that Jesus is the light in the midst of all the darkness and other things that are going on in the world. Um, If you want to book that, you can come and speak to me or we've got QR codes and different ways you can sign up as well. Um, And leaflets, if you'd like to share and invite your friends to come along to that, then do that. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Naomi, and thanks for the the wonderful images that you shared, and and Chris for his great skill in taking them. Um, We we have got an amazing world out there, haven't we? But um, we've also got God's Word, which is as much a light to our path as any lights in the sky. So let's just turn to God's Word as we hear our reading for today from Acts chapter 14, starting at verse 19. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples gathered round him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derbe. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord, in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Persia, they went down to Atalia. From Atalia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they'd been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. And may God bless that reading of his word and our examination of it later. Meanwhile, we're going to stand again, and if we're able, and worship God. We're going to begin with a song that Naomi introduced at the evening service a few weeks ago. It's a great song. You might want to sit just just, just now and we'll sing the the first verse and the chorus through and then then as you get used to it. I think it's a a great song and it'll be great for us to learn it in the morning as well.
And I think we can all just say amen to that prayer. And actually, that praise, I think, would very well fit as maybe what Paul and Barnabas would have sung at the end of this session that we're looking at. Because we've come to the the next section in their their missionary journey. Uh, We've been working through the book of Acts, and we've heard over the past few weeks how they set off on great adventures. Um, We've tracked their, their journey, their progress, Um, how the church had grown so rapidly from the small group in that locked room on Pentecost to expanding across to the ends of the then known world. And we get to the end of Acts when Paul's finally got to Rome and he remained there, we think, until his death, preaching, writing, proclaiming the kingdom of God to anyone who'd listened to it, whether they wanted to or not, and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. A shining example that none of us are probably able to look up to. But we've, we've been travelling around with them. And I think the, the wee maps up there, which I find very helpful because things don't have the same name. He'd left Antioch in Syria and he'd gone via Cyprus to an Attila and then another Antioch and then round this big loop. And we've got him at Lystra last week and he goes on to Derby and then they make their way back. This was the big part of the the Roman Empire at the time. This is where the empire had spread, and they went to the limits of it with the gospel. We thought about um, the persecution that broke out in Jerusalem after Stephen was killed, and the church had scattered with the persecution and formed and grown dramatically in Antioch. And Barnabas was dispatched from Jerusalem mission control, and we had a space theme going on for quite a while. We'll get to the end of it today, I promise to check it out, just to see what was going, and then took Paul with him. They spent a year there, and then they were blasted off into space. And I think we have a... We had, in Acts 13, we read, Now the church in Antioch there were prophets and teachers. While they were worshipping the, the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And from that initial blasting off, we've come across unusual places for mission control to be based. If you've missed any of the sermons, go back and it'll make a bit more sense. Um, We've had aborted missions with other space-relating headings. And today, as we travel on the last part of the journey, I want to consider two final aspects, being lost in space and mission completed. You can read for yourselves in in chapters 12, 13 and the start of 14 about where they travelled, how they were received and the great acts that God performed through them. In Paphos, a sorcerer and false prophet had gained Paul and Barnabas access to the proconsul who then believed and the false speaker was blinded just showing God's power for those who go against him. In Perga and the other Antioch, Paul preached a great sermon and the Jews were jealous very jealous of the response from many of their community. And Gentiles believed, and they were actually welcomed into the church. But their leaders weren't happy either, and trouble stirred up. So the apostles left. It would have seemed very much like mission aborted. But they travelled on to Iconium, where once more both the Jews and Gentiles accepted Christ as the promised Messiah and their personal saviour. He's God, and he's my God. And once more, plots were made to stone Paul and Barnabas, so they fled, again, going wrong. In Lystra and Derbe, there was a miraculous healing, and the two, we heard about last week, when words were used in very different ways. And the two of them were seen as gods, and the locals tried to make sacrifices. And we left it last week with them once again in a very, very difficult situation. So moving on, How did they get out of it? Where did they go? What happened next? And as always, God's word was written then, but it's relevant now because it's the Holy Spirit at work. So before we look at this and see what it meant to Paul and Barnabas and the others, let's just ask God that he will make it relevant to us too, that he will speak to us in this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is right, your word is true, and your word stands forever. Forgive us when we try to ignore the bits that make us uncomfortable and focus on the bits that we like and turn them to our ends. 
And I just pray this morning that the words in my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. For we want to know what you are saying to each of us and as a church for today and for tomorrow and as many days as you give us until you come again in glory. So bless all that is said and done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we get into the the passage, and I think the bits will come up for you to see where we're we're going. So starting at verse 19, we we thought about how persecution followed Paul. seemed to be he attracted it, didn't he? A challenge, do we do enough to attract persecution? Or do people not even know we're there to be angry about? Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. Now these Jews from Antioch and Iconium, they weren't just content in chapter 14, verses 5 and 6, to kick him out of their region for what he was doing. They followed him and they brought the persecution with him. Some of them had travelled more than 100 miles just to continue to make Paul miserable. Has anybody actually come more than 100 foot to make you miserable because you've declared the word of God? Have you ever done enough to upset anybody? We shouldn't be looking for persecution, but it seems to me inevitable that if we're really doing God's work, people are going to get upset as they're challenged. They were dedicated adversaries of Paul. They believed in what they believed in and they didn't like it upset. And I just went through my mind, what a contrast to our current widespread head in the sand acceptance of what seemed to be non-biblical versions of the gospel, of the church being slandered and corrupted. Nothing to do with me. No, they were angry about it. Should we be out more stirred up? A righteous anger? Anyway, they came and they incited these people against Paul and Barnabas and they instigated stoning him. A clear way to execute him without actually going through any legal approaches. And the crowd turned. The same people who wanted to worship them and make them gods, just that little bit earlier, then turned against them. Just how fickle we can be. Their admiration of the miracle and a desire to honour Paul and Barnabas as God didn't last long when it came to the challenge about what is that going to mean for your own life. We can have all the wonderful rallies. We do. Great type people coming to preach. People go along with it, but when does it become reality? When does it settle in to being a personal faith? There's different views on what happened. Some think that Paul was actually killed and raised to life again. I don't go in for conspiracy theories. What I did notice was that they gathered round him. And when we're hurt, when we're wounded, we need our Christian brothers and sisters, our Christian family, to gather round us. Or we need to go and gather round somebody else when we see them having a hard time. But I do wonder if at that point Paul or Barnabas or any of the newly converted Jews and Gentiles had a fleeting thought, oh, it's all lost here. We'll never get home. Or my faith will get me through. God never never let me down yet and never will in this life or the next. I don't know. Do we think it's a bit of a lost in space? We've got these two people who went up. They were going to be up there a few days and they're up there for months and months and months. Do they feel lost? I wonder how they felt when their little capsule that had taken them up sort of floated away safely back to earth and they were left there. Ever felt a bit stranded in your faith? What I found really, really interesting when I was looking into this a bit more, that Barry Millwall, Wilmore, one of them who is stuck, actually is a Christian home with another Christian because one of the other people on the crew that were already there came up with the other organisation it's from his same evangelical church in Houston. He's got, God has given him that Christian support. It just, I just thought that was quite, just real interesting thing that God had that prepared in advance. 
and we don't know what impact these two people with an outspoken, declared Christian faith, what impact they're having on those around them. It will be interesting to see when they all come back how people's lives have been changed because of that experience of being stuck in a very small place with two evangelical Christians. I I feel sorry for them. (laughs) Maybe I shouldn't, but I do. Anyway, getting back to the passage. When Paul was revived, however it happened, what would your reaction have been? Because I think mine would have been to get as quickly as possible. But no, he didn't. He went back into the city. He'd been driven out of Antioch and Iconium by this travelling mob. And it seems to me that he was determined to leave Lystra on his own terms. God doesn't run away from battles. God sometimes leads us right into them. And we do it on his terms, not the opposition's. Anyway, moving on to the next verse. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples. After being stoned to virtually to death, after being chucked out, my instinct might have been to just, I'll just keep under, under the radar a bit. But no, God still had work for them to do. Any opposition that came against them, they didn't care. They were doing God's work, and he saw them through. And then they returned home. I'd like to look at the last section of verses in, in a three sort of different bits. I felt there's a message, and there's the work they were doing, and then the itinerary. So moving on, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, we must go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. Instead of just going home, they went back to see how people were doing. They made sure that they were all right. That these new Christian churches, these young Christians, they would have heard what was happening to the others. They would have known about what was going on. They went back to strengthen and encourage them. God will get us all through this. Because I'm sure if the the, the Jews and Gentile leaders had gone off 100 miles to cause bother, they would have been causing bother where they were at home before they left. I don't think it was a day trip to cause trouble. It was something that would have grown out of what was going on. And also that the spirit was still moving because as they spoke, they made more disciples. More and more people came to find Christ as their personal saviour, to have their sins forgiven, have their life start over again, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But we all need strengthening. We all need feeding. And that's what they did. We sometimes need a good telling. Keep going in the faith. It's no small thing to walk with the Lord year after year, trial after trial. It takes a strong soul and an encouraged faith. And that's what my answer is to people who say, oh, I can be a Christian at home on my own. Yes, but you're never going to grow very much. We need to be with each other. We need to draw on each other's strength when we're feeling weak. We need to be able to support others when they're feeling down. We need to share the insights God's given us into his word and into life in him with each other. We can't all go and read everything, but we trust God to just give us the word that we need. Ian came over to me during the praise block, and he says, I'm not sure if it's from God or not, but keep going, you're doing well. What a wonderful encouragement when someone says, I think God's saying. And if we feel that for somebody, please, please tell them. Don't say, oh, I think that, and then afterwards say, well, I knew that. Go and tell them, because somebody is sitting waiting for that word of encouragement, that word of exhortation, that word of teaching, that word of understanding and support and love and care. So care for each other. It's not up to us who are put up the front. God uses us for some things. I don't know quite what, but he does. But you're everybody who is part of his kingdom, part of his family, has that responsibility and that role. We all need that. But there's also that warning, we must go through many tribulations. Don't say to people, become a Christian and everything is hunky-dory for the rest of your days, because that's a lie. We all go through problems. 
Look, just look at Paul's situation. Talk to anybody here about their walk in the Christian life. That is in God's plan that we trust him in the bad times as well as the good. That his testimony is true, that we can then witness to his great saving power when things go wrong. When we say, Jesus loves me, Jesus forgives me despite what I'm doing or what's going on. And then in our reaction, because in the world, something goes wrong, you fight against it, you sue people, you, you, you get angry. We have to say, I don't know why, but God will use this because God uses all things for good. Maybe difficult at the time, but eventually we test our faith. Do I believe? Do I not? Do I have that safety net or am I lost? Anyway, moving back to Paul and Barnabas. We then hear, so when they had appointed elders in every church and, with, and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Not only were Paul and Barnabas creating bodies of Christians, they were starting to say, we'll form it into church. Places where people could go, places where the gospel would be established, places where when the trials and tribulations, when the problems came, there was somewhere to go. Places where, there were, where you could go to gather, to worship together, that you could grow in your faith, that you could enjoy God together. And as we know, as soon as you start getting people into to groups and bunches of things, it needs a little bit of an organisation, otherwise it just becomes like herding cats. And if you've ever tried it, it's a waste of time. They'd only been there comparatively recently, so these new Christians were young in their faith. They didn't have people who'd had four years at New College or ten years at somewhere else or lived experience of... For some of us in the congregation, 50, 60 years of walking with Christ. God was doing something new. And God still is doing something new. So we should never limit God to our structures, but look to see where our structures can evolve to support the work he's doing. Because it's God's work and it's God's church. And we just have the privilege of joining in and being part of it. So they appointed elders. We had new elders appointed recently, and there's much discussion and debate and prayer and fasting before the names are put forward. They didn't have that opportunity here. They were all young Christians. But that's when the Holy Spirit's guidance comes into it. Because none of us who are elders have anything of ourselves that makes us good for the job or right for the job. It's because the Holy Spirit guides and inspires and leads but we all need discipled, we all need exhorted, we all need to grow, no matter if we're elders or we're not. But the pattern was established for structure in the church. And interesting, and prayed and fasting and commended them to God. They, Paul and Barnabas desperately wanted this to work for the people's sake. Not for theirs, not for saying, look what I've done, but for God's church. Just as the sending church in Antioch, right at the beginning of this missionary journey, had prayed and fasted and sent them out. But in the end, Paul and Barnabas can only trust in God's ability to keep these churches healthy. Then they moved on. They didn't hang around to make sure it was all right. They trusted God and stepped on. So what was their itinerary? They'd passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. Now they reached, they, now they, when they had preached the word in Persia, they went to Atalia. From there they sailed to Antioch, where they'd been commended to the grace of God for the work they had completed. They turned, returned kind of the way they'd gone, but they didn't stop at Cyprus. There was no full sorcerer to sort out. The proconsul was presumably still living his Christian life, and they went back to their home congregation. Wow. Splash with space thing again, splash down, back home. Sometimes it's really good to get back home. It's great to go off to other places. It's great to go and worship with other Christians. But there's something about coming home to my church family. 
It gives you that place to say it was good or it was dreadful and I don't ever want to go there again. It gives us the ability to share the way other people worship God, that we can learn and grow more, that we hear different things, that we can expand our horizons. But they came back safe home. But that's only partially true because that immediate mission was complete, was accomplished. But it isn't that long. As we know, they set off again. If they hadn't, we wouldn't be here. So they arrived back in Antioch. Now, when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. They came home. Their success with evangelism amongst the Gentiles and the blessing of God that it demonstrated showed that what God had done in Antioch after the persecution and the scattering was not unique. God wanted to replicate this work across the whole of the known world. The trip was a success. The door had been opened, the faith had been opened to the Gentiles, although not without obstacles. The difficulties of the travelling, the confrontation with Elymas and Cyprus, the quitting of John Mark, being driven out of Antioch and Iconium, the temptation to receive adoration, being stoned. Yet they were not deterred from the work God wanted them to do. And one commentator presents this challenge. It can and should be asked of each follower of Jesus, what will it take for you to back down from doing God's will? What kind of temptation or obstacle or opposition will do it? Nothing stopped Jesus from doing God's will on our behalf. So as we look to him, can we say we won't be stopped either? The back at home, in their home church, I presume, we can assume rather that Paul and Barnabas took a long break we're told they stayed there a long time. But I bet they found plenty of things to do. I bet they didn't just sit there and say, yeah, that's me done. I bet they got involved in doing the cleaning, organising this, doing that, doing the next thing, helping with other things that were going on. I'm certain they wouldn't have had a ticker tape parade. I'm pretty well guaranteed they wouldn't have had the, the welcome that, received, that um, the astronauts received after landing on the moon. And there again, and something else I hadn't realised, that Buzz Aldrin had celebrated Holy Communion as the craft circled above the lunar surface, took his faith up there, and it was grown and expanded. But their safe return and the testimony of God's work in salvation, healing and protection would have been the cause for many celebrations and encouragement as the church developed. So they had a time to rest, to reflect, and to give thanks. But as I say, we'll find off find where they go later. So in our missional context, what are we doing? We do, and we should, fast and pray to seek God's will for various things that we're doing in the church. As a church, but as individuals. Have you recently asked God what he wants you to do, rather than us to do? We do and we should support in prayer and practical terms those who are out in the mission field, both locally and further afield. Do we have somebody that we're particularly interested, that we particularly pray for, or something that we particularly pray for? Maybe ask God, lay that on my heart. What do you want me to be involved with? Or are we too old, or too young, or too new a Christian, or too busy, or too settled? challenge that comes from me to me is that uh, when God we're doing what God wants he moves and blesses and produces his fruit we see his hand at work and we find ourselves in places we never imagined doing things we never thought possible each and every one of us is called to serve our savior and that's in the big things and the big roles as well as the smallest of actions in the most secret of places yes it may and it probably will upset our routine, it will change our priorities, it will bring us trials and tribulations, and even persecution in various forms. But although we may just feel so lost, capsule's gone, we can't get back. We're not. Jesus didn't just commission his disciples and us, but he promised to be with them, as we know in Matthew 28. 
Jesus came to them and said, Authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So whether we're being prompted to set out in faith, we're in the middle of successful service, we're feeling lost and everything's falling apart, or safe back at home, resting before the next adventure. Let us all, from the oldest to the youngest, from the newest Christian to those who've been walking with the Lord for so long, let us all be sure and confident and rejoice that in Jesus Christ, the mission is complete. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And I thank you for what you gave me to say this morning. And I just pray that by the Holy Spirit, you will speak to each of our hearts and minds, that you will, people will remember the bits that are for them and forget the bits that are not of you. But most of all, Lord, that we will all be stirred to see our role, that we will find a new focus that you're giving to us, that you will give us the strength, the encouragement, and the support of everybody around us to step out of the comfort zones, to step in to what you are already doing, that your glory may fill this community, this country, and the whole of your creation. So, Lord, we give ourselves afresh to you. We acknowledge we can do nothing of ourselves, but with you, we can do everything. We give you our praise and our thanks and ask for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. We're now going to praise in some very familiar words.
And just thinking about the, you know, that we are all here for each other. We are here as God's family. And we have a very special event in God's family today. Um, Many of us know Maggie Biggins. Yes? Anybody know Maggie? Yeah, some good, because otherwise I feel a bit awkward. Some of you don't know Maggie. You've missed a treat in your life. Maggie's no longer able to get to church on Sundays because her health's not so good anymore. So she watches on, online at home with, with Fiona and Joe. I'm not sure when exactly. But today's a special day. She's 90 today, which I think is very good. So in her absence, I'm sure, can we have a rousing chorus of happy birthday to Maggie? Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Maggie, happy birthday to you. A wonderful witness of a woman who's followed God for so, so many, many years, never complains, never gets upset and just... If you get the opportunity to meet her, just go and say hi, Maggie, and you'll be blessed, I can assure you. So let's end the service, if we're able, by standing again. And rather than a benediction, let's all just sing the blessing to each other as we go from this place to serve the Lord wherever he calls us.
Jesus. Come quickly. Amen. There's tea and coffee at the back. Please take time, talk to each other, support each other, encourage each other, because we're Christ's family in this place. Glory displayed by pouring. 
Came down for us to save us for. 